This is a nice project because it's really easy to do and the end result is very useful because it's a little tool for your test bench and it's an LED tester. And it's very simple, it's just a PP3 battery connector, resistor in line, a Molex style connector at the end, or whatever you can get. You could use the DuPont connector, but I, I'm just using the Molex connector because I have a lot of them. And also because it's quite deep and it just suits this application very well. And it lets you just plug in an LED and test it just to see if the LED is working okay. It's, and it also lets you compare LEDs and it could be used as a little emergency light as well just to create a splash of light. So very simple. All we're going to be doing here, if I bring the notepad in, we'll do the resistor calculation right now, which is very, very easy. What we're going to be doing is we're going to get a standard PP3 battery. So that's a symbol for a battery. 9 volts. And we're going to put a resistor in line. So that's a positive. Uh, the resistor can go anywhere, really. Uh, and we're going to have an LED, which is actually going to be in a little socket. And that's a negative there. So here's the LED, and typically speaking, uh, to allow for the wide variety of LED voltages, the lowest voltage is going, of the LED is going to result in the highest current for a given resistor. So we'll choose the uh, resistor based on the lowest voltage LED, which is going to be a red LED probably, which is about 2 volts. So we've got 9 volts across the battery, we've got 2 volts across the LED, and that leaves 7 volts to drop across the resistor. So to choose the resistor value, R equals voltage divided by the current we want. So that's the voltage we want to drop, so R equals the 7 volts that we want to drop divided by the current we want, which is about 20 milliamps. So that's going to be in amps 0 0.02. 20 milliamps or 0 0.02 amps. So if I bring the calculator in, and we put in the voltage to be dropped, 7 volts, divided by the current, 0 0.02, equals 350 ohms would be the ideal value, but the nearest standard value is actually 330 ohms. And the colour of the 330 ohm resistor, the colour bands are orange, orange, brown, 3, 3 and 1, 0. So um, that's what we're going to be using, a 330 ohm resistor. So to start, we're going to get uh, one of these battery snaps. Now it's usually cheaper just to buy them in a pack of uh, multiple snaps, just because, you know, the co difference in cost between just buying one and buying a pack of ten is not really that much. Especially if you're buying them online, because ultimately most of it, the cost ends up postage. And you get different types of these. You get ones with the horrible sort of floppy tops, with a sort of fiberboard, like, almost like reinforced cardboard with the connections punched into it. Or you get these solid plastic ones that are clipped together. I prefer the solid plastic ones because when you're actually putting them on off the battery, they actually, it's easier to do so. And they just look nicer too. And they've got other uses. So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to cut one of these leads in half to insert the resistor. So I'm going to choose just the red lead, the positive. I'm going to get the stripping tool and strip about say about four or five millimetres, which is just over eighth of an inch of insulation off that. I'm going to get 330 ohm resistor and I'm going to bring in the helping hands again because they're ideal for this application. And I'm going to crop one of the leads down to about, say about five or six millimetre, which is about a quarter of an inch. And I'm going to grip the other end of the LED in the helping hands, the helping hands which are just walking all over the place at the moment. I'm going to flow some solder onto that end of the resistor. And I'm also going to flow some solder onto the cropped and twisted uh, positive lead. And then I'm going to flow the two of them together, but once again I'm going to be using flux. Now, in the last video, I used standard plumbing flux and quite rightfully some some people mentioned the comments that it's not the ideal thing because it can be quite acidic and quite you know it can cause corrosion problems but um the that type of flux is a sort of it's a sort of acidy base but encapsulated in a sort of oily greasiness so uh, it takes heat to usually liberate that but uh, the correct uh, flux to use is an electronic flux and this is a flux pen you can buy these off eBay as well or your local electronic supplier and it's basically a pen that you can refill with a flux of your choice, a liquid flux. And it's got a tough fibre tip and a spring-loaded release mechanism 
and you just want the tip to be wet. It's, it's designed for applying onto circuit boards, little spots of flux just to help uh, flow solder. But you just need to touch the tip of this on whatever you're actually wanting flux on. If it gets dry, you press it down on a surface like the circuit board and theoretically this, the flux flows on in a controlled manner. Or in my case, it just splurges explosively out the end and makes a big mess. As is usually the case with this. So now I've put a tiny trace of flux on. You can't see it. It's just wet with the flux. I'm going to hold those two connections together that are pre-soldered and I'm just going to reflow them. And it's releasing the flux, activating it, and it's just joined them together in a nice clean joint. The advantage, you, you don't need the flux, the advantage is you end up with a slightly better joint and it's a shinier, cleaner, and it's less spiky. It's less prone to pulling a, a dry solder spike off it, uh, which is good when you're putting it into the heat shrink sleeving, which we'll be doing. So I'm cropping the other end of the resistor down to about the quarter of an inch-ish, five, six millimetre length and gripping it in the helping hands again. And I'm going to flow the solder on to that end of the resistor. And the lead that I've already cropped off, the, when I cut that lead in half, one end is already stripped and tinned, but I'm going to reflow that with my favourite lead-based solder, which just works better than this sort of lead-free stuff. It just produces a nice, cleaner, just nicer joint. Uh, if you ever use the diff if you use the two sol solders, you'll notice the difference. So applying a wee drop more of the flux just by touching it onto that. So that this pen will just last ages with that refill. I've never ever had to refill it. It came filled already and uh, has lasted for a long time. Uh, I'm just going to put the two uh, pre-soldered connections together and I'm going to flow them again. And once again, let them cool down and it's a lovely clean shiny joint, which uh, you'd be able to see if the iPad actually wasn't fixed focus, which kind of blurs things as you get close to the lens. Blurs them at the bench. One day I'm going to use a better camera. I promise. Uh, I like the fact that the iPad isn't always hunting with the focus. I like that it's just always fixed because uh, you see other videos that have the camera hunting with the focus and it just kind of looks a bit odd. But, you know, I'll go over that. I'll end up using a Android camera or something like that. So uh, here's the heat shrink sleeve in which I've chosen to easily slide over the resistor. A close fit so that it's going to grip onto the, you know, it's going to shrink down enough that it's going to grip onto the PVC insulation. Someone else was mentioning that they use the <coughs> adhesive lined heat shrink. The adhesive lined heat shrink is almost like hot melt glue in the inside of it, a coating of it. Um, I don't use that, I just use this uh, non heat shrink. Uh, non-adhesive lined heat shrink, but you know they're both equally good. The advantage of the stuff with the multiple lining is it does, it kind of sticks to things better, it sort of fills in, it seals things better. Great for outdoor electrical connections if you're m mating onto material that the glue bonds onto. So I'm bringing in the hot uh, air gun. This is the, the hot air gun on a Yahoo 8786D station from eBay. And it's very quiet, and you can set the temperature and the airflow. I keep it fairly low airflow. And this is just perfect for doing things like this. It's, I get a lot of use out of this. It's nice, it's quiet, it's light, it's always there. As soon as you take it out of the cradle, it starts up. So that makes it just ideal. So I'm just uh, running that around the heat shrink until it's all shrunk down. And that'll help hold it in place. And also makes it look quite neat and gives it a little bit of extra strength. Now I'm going to grip this... Uh, connector and I'm going to pull the leads to the same length and I'm going to crop them flush at the end so they're both the same length. This one is already pre-soldered and tinned but I'm actually going to cut that off because I'm going to be putting these into crimps and I want fresh uh, equal length and um, uh, unsoldered. I want them uh, just twisted because uh, it's just going to be better for the crimping. And I'm going to twist those he said, I didn't I just say untwisted? Yeah, what I really meant was unsoldered. However, if you've not got a crimping tool for these crimps, uh, if you're only doing a small volume of them, then you can solder them. And I've mentioned before that my preference, if you're soldering them, is to mount them so that the open end that you're soldering into is pointing down so that the solder is less likely to wick up into the sort of moving contact area. Otherwise, if the solder solders the contact spring, it just basically the contact stops giving when you push 
the lead into it and you'll end up when you push the LED in it just won't want to go past that because it's just not giving it's just not springing down the best tool though is one of these I when I first got this tool it was quite expensive but justifiable when you're doing quite a lot and I just didn't really click with this at all at first it took me a while to get into the swing of using it but uh, the best thing to do if you do get one of these is get lots of the terminals and just aimlessly crimp it onto bits of wire, crimp crimps onto bits of wire until you get the feel for it. And this, uh, the nice thing about the crimping tool is that it grips. You put the part of the insulation into one section and then the bare copper into the other section of the crimp and uh, it grips onto the PVC and curls in it, pinches in it like a strain relief. Well, it is a strain relief. And uh, while the other bit uh, folds the uh, metal lugs of the crimp around the copper of the wire and makes a good sound electrical connection. It's surprisingly strong. I don't think I've ever really had a uh, wire fail in a crimp, which is good. The crimps can corrode if you use them outdoors if you don't put some sort of oil or grease on them. But that's about it. I like to keep them well separate. Uh, if I'm doing outdoor connectors, I'll space them apart uh, and just leave gaps in between them to avoid sort of electrolytic corrosion and stuff like that. So now these are crimped on, uh, choose which side of the crimp it doesn't really matter, but I like to always put the, the positive in the side marked one and slide it in and it will latch in, slide the negative in and it will latch in, and then take a sharpie. Take a couple of Sharpies, in fact, if you've got them. If you've got red and black, that's good. Uh, and mark either just one side for polarity, or in this case, I'm going to mark two sides. I'm putting the red on first because it's the lightest colour, and that means that I can then, uh, if I go put too much red on it crosses onto the other side, I can just black over it with the black side, black pen, which I'm doing. So that's uh, me mark the polarity on. I'm going to clip this on to the PP3 now because the LED tester is now complete and all I need to do is stuff a random LED into it and there we go, that's it working nicely. Uh, another thing you can do, if you choose a really high value of resistor deliberately, for instance, uh, if you use a 100k resistor in here, which only passes about 100 microamps or so, or less than 100 microamps in fact, and you would think that would that's about a tenth of a milliamp, but it's not going to light an LED brightly. What it's useful for is when you get really shitty batches of LEDs from Chinese suppliers, supplied, you know, in polythene bags without anti-static precautions, it's sometimes quite useful to test them all at very low current to weed out ones that have damaged uh, films. Because you know how we've discovered with the LEDs in the past, particularly the high-power LEDs, that Damaged LEDs tend to develop a sort of resistance across them that uh, means they pass current without lighting up and it's a sign that usually that the film is damaged. If you use a 100k resistor uh, to run the LED at a very low current from the PP3 cell, the bat battery, then you, you'll find that the dodgy LEDs either flicker or light very dimly or don't light at all and that's an indication that they've got resistive leakage across them. Um, and it's interesting to note that sometimes the fault clears if you run it, uh, put it across another tester at the higher current and then put it back to the low current unit, but uh, that's not uh, an indication that the fault has gone. It's just that you've blown it clear temporarily because the, if the film's damaged in the LED the, internally, the thin film and the gallium nitride LED, then it, it's just going to give problems later in life. But um, as it is, uh, the little, just with the 330 ohm resistor, PP3 clip, uh, Molex connector, it just makes a really handy little tool that's just so useful.